God bless you. Remain standing. We're certainly honored to have Brother Therese with us. Going to bring us the Word of the Lord this afternoon. Are you hungry for the Word today? Thank God for His Word. It's forever settled in heaven. Honored to have Him with us. Pastors, Lake Charles, Louisiana. Give Him and the Lord a good hand as He comes today. Bring us the Word of the Lord. Thank you, Pastor Shield, and praise the Lord, everyone. Praise it's good to see you today. You may be seated. Great music, great worship, great singing. Brother Spell, it's my privilege to get to be here with you again. A great friend, and enjoy singing with this fellow. He is, he is one of the greatest voices the Pentecost has ever heard and, and hosted. And for him to be here this week makes it just so special. Praise God. Brother Marler, what a message. Oh, my goodness. It's great to be here with all the saints of God who hold the rope. Amen. I don't think that I will ever forget that. And if you will, as quickly as you can point that vehicle down to Lake Charles. If you'll come, preach that for the congregation in Lake Charles. God bless you all. Ministers, pastors, evangelists, it's my privilege to be with you today. I'm honored that uh, the invitation has come to um, our home to be with, first of all, your fine leaders, Bishop Shield and Pastor Shield and their wives and families. My, my, my. My first time to be in B.B. Arkansas in this great conference that you folks have been conducting, I understand, for quite some time. I know a good number of you, brethren, that um, the past few years we've been in um, Brother Joy's gathering. And to be with you again is just a delight of mine. Anxious to hear all of the ministers that are yet to speak. And Brother... Alvear, last evening I hear that it was just an explosion of anointing and um, a father-daughter team. Now think of that. God bless you. Amen. Praise God. Brother Scott Hall, I'm anxious to hear the ministry of the word that uh, you were due on Sunday. They'll get that word to me. They'll get that to me. I don't know if Brother Bo is here, but you're going to be blessed by the unique ministry and scholarly ministry of Brother Bo. Amen. Brother Kenny Godare, no finer evangelist that lives. You, um, you've got great preachers here, and I'm just glad to be standing alongside of them and count myself the least, if you will. I'm just a voice that um, God has been very gracious to. I am thrilled that um, in B.B. Arkansas there is a huge footprint not only in the city visible but in the spirit. A great spiritual footprint has been been made in B.B. Arkansas because of the dedication 50 years. The anniversary of this great congregation and leaders. We celebrate you all. Yeah, give yourself a big hand. 50 years. Bishop Shield, Pastor Shield, we honor you, your family, for the celebration that is being enjoyed this, this very gathering. Fifty years is a long time for a group to be faithful and dedicated. And look what you have done. This beautiful facility, the lighthouse. And we drove in here last night at midnight, and that beacon was still spinning even at the midnight hour. Praise God. How about that? Beautiful church, beautiful facility. We walked in at midnight and, and Sister Shield had every convenience and comfort that you could ever be graced with right there waiting for us as we walked in the door as weary travelers. and They've taken such great care of us. Thank you for it all. Um, it's obvious that you folks have traveled just a bit. You've covered every base. And it's a pleasure to, to be with you today. I'm going to read from the book of 
1 Corinthians, per request of Bishop Shield, I'm going to read a portion of Corinthians 11, and if God will so enable and help, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about these first 16 verses, and I believe that it is truth. Corinthians 11, these verses 1 through 16, I believe they are the inspired word of God. It is not to be deleted. It has not been deleted. It has not been superseded by any other idea nor thought. It is the inspired, anointed word of God. Did not the apostle Peter, speaking of the words of his brother Paul, say, his words are sometimes pretty strong but they're scripture. And so we are today going to involve ourselves in what is the word of the Lord. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances. Everybody say ordinances. As I have delivered them unto you. But I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ. And the head of the woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. But every woman that prayeth or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. For that is even all one as if she were shaven. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame, for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. You may be seated. I'm not going to read all 16 verses. I will utilize those 16 verses. But I'll not take the time. And I am noting what time it is right now. It's obvious that you folks are very used to just flowing with the Holy Ghost. And um, the clock follows suit. So here you are. Praise God. I am <clears throat> I'm going to, by the help of God today, talk to you on this subject. Divine order. Divine order. Now you've already had your lunch. I'm not the preacher standing in between you and the meal. You've already had your lunch, and so the challenge is not hunger pains. The challenge is, can you stay awake or not? <laughs> now, if I were the evangelist for this evening service, I might be tuned just a little tighter than what I am for right now. I want to speak with clarity today if God would so enable me. And I want you to be able to hear and to receive with clarity. And so let's talk about 1 Corinthians chapter 11 under the subject of divine order. Paul begins with a strong, a strong invitation. He says, be ye followers of me. And that word is mimetai in the original language, which is we get our word imitate from this that he begins with. He said, I want you to be followers of me or I want you to imitate me as I also, in essence, am following or doing what Christ expects. And here is the command. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and... Keep, and that word keep is more than just a loose and a casual corralling, 
But it is something that has a holding fast or a holding down effect. And the reason that you can gather an intense strength to that is because it has the prefix of kata, which has the general force and meaning of down, that you hold down, that you keep it held down. Don't let this move. Don't let this be transported. Don't let it be exchanged, etc. There is a purpose of it being immovable in what he is about to embrace in this subject as it is written in the letter. He says, I want you to I want you to keep and hold fast or hold down, keep holding down the ordinances and that uh, is a debated thing among some modern so-called scholars and their, their title as scholar is questionable in my estimation if you question and if you try to move what the Apostle Paul said I want you to hold down tie down and not let move. And that is the traditions, the ordinances, the word that is, that is employed for traditions is not a man-made tradition. What are we discussing? Are we discussing a man-made tradition? Paradosis. Are they, are they man-made ideas? Are they things to be put up for panel discussions at your next conference, fellowship meeting, and for men to pronounce a verdict of a, a yes or no about it? These traditions, what are we talking about? There is, there is a pressure against those who would follow and be imitators of the Apostle Paul. There's pressure that is being applied against this as I preach by entire congregations and entire movements who have declared a greater enlightenment and they deem it to be just something that was cultural of that day that it was just a cultural aspect of the day first of all may I tell you at the very beginning that when you discuss the creation of God that is not just a one century or one generation embracement but the very authority of God being the head of all of all of creation that is an eternal fixation of not only thought but of truth and so he says I want you to keep the paradoxes which are the which are the traditions or the ordinances don't be afraid of the word traditions don't be afraid of that word further pressure comes against you who would hold fast these things that Paul stated For the pressure comes in that saying, you're being pharisaical. If you be too vocal and be too strong about these things, you're being pharisaical. Let me ask you first of all, do you know what a Pharisee is? Make sure you know what a Pharisee is before you tag somebody with this. It is very Very plain in Scripture where Jesus in Matthew chapter 15 verses 1 through 9 derided the Pharisees. For what? Not for sticking to the letter of the law. He did say in another place, except your righteousness exceed the Pharisees. Not everything they were doing he let them know was wrong. But it was the attitude and it was the loopholes and it was the circumference of the law for their own convenience sake 
that they had invented and were practicing. It became a matter of the outward instead of it being from the very soul. For those of you that would accuse the church of the living God for wanting to live as the word of God pronounces, then would you please consider what Jesus said to the Pharisees. He said, you are replacing the commandments of God for the traditions of men. And you are speaking things with the mouth, but you're far from me with the heart. And so is it pharisaical to do the expectations of the Apostle Paul? Or is it Phariseeism to find a loophole to not do? what the command has been set forth as. Let's define that as the very beginning. Don't be afraid of the word custom. Don't be afraid of the word tradition because they are as is delineated here in chapter 11. These are the expectations of God and they are truth. Discounting the real word of God And just worshiping with your lips only. I love worship, but not at the expense of truth. God loves worship, real worship. He that worships me must be in spirit and in truth. Don't ever forsake, don't ever let go of the ordinances that God said, Kata, hold down. Keep them nailed down, if you will, so that they are immovable. Paul is not speaking here by permission. There are some things the Apostle Paul writes and says, I have not a commandment concerning this, but I speak by the permission of God as of one who has obtained mercy. This is not just by the permission of God. This is the very strength of the order of creation that is announced and rehearsed in this particular chapter. And so, here we go. There is, there is a word that is down in chapter, or verse 16, that is parallel with this word of paradosis that I've used, which is ordinances or traditions. And it is sunetheon, which is custom. And so we realize by the time you get to the end of this subject, verse 16, where Paul says, If any man be a lover of strife concerning this subject, we have no such custom. We have no tradition. We do not have the habit of deterring from the word of God. It is that strong. If you believe that and are in agreement with Paul the Apostle, say praise the Lord. Let us begin, if you will, with verse 3. But I would have you, I would have you to know this. That the head of every man is Christ. The word for head is kaphale, which is the head or authority. The head of every man is Christ. And here is the word again. And the head of every woman or head of the woman is the man. And the head of Christ, meaning the flesh of God, is God. He gives, he gives in an encapsulated form, verse 3, he gives the order and the reason why. Every Every gender that God created must present itself in a particular way. He gives the reason why and gives the order of creation in verse 3 and then details that as he goes on. You have God who is the head of man. You have man who is the head of woman. And you have 
you have Christ that I will, that I will, if I, by the help of God, let you know was our example. He is the head and he submits himself to God, which is the spirit, the flesh submitting itself to the spirit. It is not God number one submitting himself to God number two. If that happens, then he ungods himself. It is simply an explanation of the flesh being in submission unto the Spirit. The way that we appear before God makes all the difference in the world, as is announced in chapter 11. That when a man prays or prophesies, The next verse involves a woman praying or prophesying. I will deal with each one separately. While we are having an act of of holy experience with God, we are expected in chapter 11 to appear before God in our proper setting And in our own unique creation. We are not a unisex gathering. We are as God created us, man and woman. And when we appear before God in order to have the return relationship with deity. We must have the correct appearance if we are either going to have honor in this experience, honor unto God, or whether we bring shame on ourselves and cast a shameful appearance and insertion, or I should say, cast a statement that is not exact against the Creator. I'm teaching this afternoon on divine order. The order of creation. The order of creation is that man was created first. And Paul says in chapter 4 that every man prophesying or praying. They're two separate words. They're not one and the same. With anything is how... It should be translated, ekon, which is having anything. And here you have the preposition again, kata, which has the general connotation of down. Down his head. If a man has anything down his head, is the literal wooden translation. What happens if any man praying or prophesying, having anything down his head, Karaskune, which is to shame, shames his head. Who is the head of man? The head of man is Christ. The head of Christ is God. We are representing order. We are to appear before God in our correct order if we are going to bring him honor and glory. The word, the word for shame is a very strong word. By the time we get through with the message today, I will explain by the usage of the words that are employed in New Testament manuscript how strong the word shame is. And that is a million dollar question among some who are in the pulpit today. What kind of a shame? How strong of a shame? Is it sin? Is it not sin? Paul just starts it off. He doesn't make any bones about it. He said, if any man prays or prophesies, having anything down his head, he he shames his head. His head is not just his own head. His head is Christ, if you will. With his head covered, having his head covered or anything down his head, he dishonoreth. Karaskune, he disfigures. Let me use the word for disfigure, not just shame. He dishonoreth, he shames, he disfigures. 
regardless of what the culture has set as acceptable, and just because tolerance has risen through one generation to the next, now it's acceptable to be on the platform and to have long hair on a man, not according to chapter 11 of the verse that I have just read. What we cannot do, woman, you're involved in the very same in the next verse. But every woman that prays or prophesied with her head uncovered, it is just the opposite. She dishonors her head. What we cannot do is represent a disfigured Christ. He is our head. Christ has a certain value. He has a certain example that he has set. Christ himself who was God manifest in flesh came down to the earth and did not compete. He did not compete against what the Spirit was. Him being found in the form of a servant, being in flesh. He humbled himself. He did not think it robbery to be equal with God, though he was God manifest in the flesh, because the Christos, which is Christ, which simply means the same thing in Hebrew as Meshach, which is Messiah, him being the anointed one. He knew the place that he was to remain in. And that is, and there was one mediator between God and man. The man, Christ, Christos, the Messiah, the Messiah, Jesus. And he did not try to compete and be elevated higher than what that flesh was to manifest and carry out. He did not let himself be king. He would escape through the crowd when they would try to force something greater on him than what his mission was. And so when we stand on the platform or we are in any other setting and we are going to pray and prophesy before God, then we must be properly we must be properly presented with our appearance and this happens to be the subject of hair the subject is not veil the subject is hair for by the time you get down to verse 14 paul makes it very clear and he says doth not nature even teach you that it is a shame for a man to have come, which is long hair. I'll describe, I'll describe what is being diced in the word cut and trim here in just a moment. I do not want to present a Christ that is dishonored. He's my head. If you get up here, and I don't care if you can sing all four parts of the scale and you can do it with the voice of an angel if a man prays or prophesies or is going to speak forth and what does we know what uh, prosukomai which is to pray means but to prophesy what does that involve and it can either be a man or a woman praying or prophesying which means these two things. Not only to foretell. To prophesy does not only mean to foretell. But it also means, equally means to foretell. To foretell the word of God. And a man or a woman that stands to pray and to speak in behalf of God. To foretell or foretell. Delivering the word of God. 
the last thing that you want to do is to have either your head covered if you're a man, anything down your head, or a woman for her head to be uncovered. Why? Because the word that I gave you is a very strong word. We dishonor or we shame or we disfigure our head. Who is our head? Ultimately, the head is God. How can I expect to honor God and disfigure Him with my appearance and presentation of Him at the same time? I'm getting a a few amens from, from the good brethren on the front. But I believe I'm in a I believe I'm in a crowd today that is a hundred percent for the way we present Christ to this world. Amen. Amen. God is not twisted. God is not disfigured. He's a merciful God who has led us in. He's writing to the Corinthians. I'm going to tell you I have not grown so much or become so high and lifted up that I can start dictating to God how I'm going to come and worship Him and how I'm going to preach tonight if it's opposite to His Word. I don't care what kind of crowd you've got sitting out in the Colosseum. Don't disfigure the Christ that you're going to present to a soul that's going to stand in eternal judgment someday. Amen, amen. There is a requirement that if we are going to come near the altar, read it again. When the sons of Aaron used strange fire and they were smitten, Moses erupted with a command. Was it a rebuke? Read it as you wish. That if we're going to come near the altar of God, then it must be in purity, meaning it must be in the accordance and with the accordance of what God has commanded. To do anything else is a dangerous proposition. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered or anything down his head, if you will. Shames, karaskune, he shames or he disfigures or he dishonors his head. But every woman that prayeth or prophesies with her head uncovered, it's the same word. Shames, dishonors, kataskune, or disfigures the head of her. The next phrase in this verse is extremely strong. In the KJV it reads, For that is even all one as if she were shaven. In the original it reads this way, For it is one and the same. Kaito alto. It is one and the same thing. It's all the same, is how Paul wrote it in this particular verse. It's all one and the same. The woman being shorn, or having been shorn, or shaved. It's pretty strong. It's pretty strong. It's all one and the same. There are two words that are employed for what I have just read. To be shorn is kero. To be shaved is suaro. And it is already pronounced by Paul that it is the ultimate shame for the woman's head to be shaven. For if a woman's hair is shorn, it's all in the one as if it is shaven. The word shorn is kero, which is to cut. 
It don't matter if you cut six inches or six feet. Cut is cut is cut according to what is here. For a very simple illustration, for those of you who say, oh, I don't, we don't believe in the women cutting our hair still in our denomination. We just believe that it's permissible if they trim it. For a simple illustration, I'd like for someone to bring up a piece of paper and a pair of scissors. And if you will demonstrate for this fine group of men and women today how you trim it without cutting it. You say, oh, preacher, that's way too hard. Is it hard to fulfill the expectation that Paul said, as I follow God, as I imitate God, you imitate me? You do what I am saying. He is, hold down. The ordinances that God delivered, that he delivered, do we believe that Paul was writing according to the inspiration of the Holy Ghost? For holy men wrote of old as they were moved on by the Holy Ghost. Do we believe that Paul was writing scripture? Or do we believe that he was simply writing his opinion? Was it just his opinion or was it scripture? And if it is scripture, then we cannot let it slide away from where we are living today. In Jesus' name. For it is one and the same, verse 5, for it is one and the same. The clincher is for those who have had just even the most remedial uh, Greek, you will find that the word auto here written in this phrase means one and the same. It is one and the same having been shaved. For if the woman, verse 6, be not covered, for the woman is not karakalupte, karakalupto. For if the woman is not covered, the discussion is not a veil. For those who would like to turn it into a veil, Paul does away with that by the time you get down to the end. Of this particular section. For he says a woman's hair is given to her ante. Which is instead of a veil. By him using the word kome which is long hair. He makes it very plain. He's not confusing nor distorting. He is not, he is not speaking with blurriness. This is not fuzzy math. This is not fuzzy theology. He uses the word kome. Look it up in your bow or Greek lexicon, which is long hair. The subject is hair. It is not whether or not a woman places a cloth over her head. It is trying to, it is trying to state that a woman must be properly covered. And that there be enough that it be as God has desired that it is deemed as a covering by the God who made woman. He knows what a woman is supposed to look like. He knows what a man is supposed to look like because he created them in the garden. We are, by having our hair short, as a man and by having uncut hair as a woman we are manifesting the proper relationship with God let me just touch on the word relationship relationship is a buzzword among the so called churches and especially the emerging church that it's all in relationship. So, and you know what? I agree with you. You are a hundred percent correct. It is all in relationship. But if you are in as much relationship as you are touting, then why are you not following 
the request of the one that you say you're in relationship with. You're right, it's all in relationship. It's not just an outward with the lips. You're looking at a group of apostolics that have the love of God and the law of God written down on their heart. A fleshly heart is in it. Hallelujah to the Lord. My heart and my soul is in it. You claim to have your heart and your soul. Love the Lord thy God with all thy strength, with all thy might. And the next word we translate it as strength, KJV. The word in Hebrew is in, with all your resources. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, and with all your resources. If you're going to do that, you're not going to disobey what the apostle wrote as a strong ordinance to all the churches, plural. Let me answer, was this only for the Corinthian church? No, no, no. By the time you get to verse 16, he said, And if there be any lover of strife among us, we have no such custom, neither the churches... And ecclesia has a plural ending at the end of that word. It was not just a singular local commandment. But he said we don't have for that custom of debate over this, over the churches at all. And so it is the answer to whether or not this is just a local cultural first century issue or not. Man changes, but God does not change. Man changes, oh, how man changes, but God does not change. And so the woman says, ah, all of the feminists make the loud voice. Then that means that we engender your pronouncing a degradation of our gender. Not at all. Let me tell you the woman who was created last, the final work of the creative strength of Elohim was not the least, but the creation of the woman out of the very essence of Mos- uh, the a- essence of Adam. I'll get on the Moses veil here in just a moment. That's one of the next things coming up. Out of the side of Adam was not not a degrading or was a lessening of the creative power of God, but was, if you will, the very apex of what the very hand of God Produced as far as its refinement and beauty, if you will. And so for a woman to present herself before God with uncut hair, it is, if you will, it is in the very setting and appearance as God knew that the woman should have to receive the glory that she should possess. Does it not say in Ephesians, does it not say a number of times that women are to subject themselves under their husbands? Is that subjection a degradation or is it a place of specific honor? I'd like for a Holy Ghost filled woman who believes that holding your place in creation as God has so commanded, I'd like for some woman here today that believes that it is not a degradation but it is a place of honor to appear before God praying and prophesying with uncut hair. If you believe that it is a place of honor and not degradation, I'd like for you to clap your hands under the Lord God 
and let the world know that there's somebody that still believes in it. Christ was our example. You say it's all on the inside. It's not on the outside. Then you tell me about the baptism that Jesus experienced when he walked down Jordan's bank into the river. Was that all inside? Does it matter what you do externally? Did Christ need it for himself? He need not be baptized for his own sake. But he knew for the example of what the flesh would be to the spirit that you and I were to follow. He said, suffer it so to be now. And he fulfilled, thank you, he fulfilled all of righteousness by something that he did externally when he walked down into the Jordan's waters and was baptized. Here you had God walking among men. John said, and we have handled the logos of life, the word of life. We have seen with our eyes, we have heard with our ears, and we have handled, we have been privileged to touch the word, the logos of God, which is God. And the scripture says in Hebrews that in the days of his flesh with strong prayers and crying he learned obedience. We're talking about the man Christ Jesus the flesh of God God among men the logos of life who of himself did not need to be baptized because there was no sin For him to repent of. There was no need for Christ to metanoe, to repent, to turn around and walk away from sin. Because there was no sin within him. So it was the logos of life, the word of life that we touched, heard and saw. And the writer of Hebrews says, in the days of his flesh... He learned obedience by the things which he suffered. When he walked down into the waters of Jordan and was baptized, he was allowing the flesh to be in obedience unto what the Spirit had ordained for that fleshly vessel. Somebody that believes that it is a glorious thing To be in obedience under the Spirit. If the body of Christ Jesus felt compelled to bring glory under the Spirit. Then we ought not feel neglected and abused. To obey what the Spirit is desiring of the church. My Lord and my God, there is so much to preach. There's no way that I could possibly preach at all. But let me tell you, it is more than just a vocal uh, situation of rhetoric. It's more than just words. It is from the very soul that I want to bring glory Unto Christ my head. (laughs) I want to bring glory unto Him. God, I want to obey You and not disobey. And I want to make sure that I make a distinct difference between the sexes. Like the old fellow that stumbled into church. Preacher was preaching about the difference. Of man and woman, he had enough to sense to say, Oh, thank goodness for that little bit of difference. Yeah, Lord. It don't take a whole lot of IQ to know 
of the value of what God intended in creation to have the difference. Let me tell you, if you have that, re if you have that reversed, go talk to the psychologists, go sit in the offices of the psychiatrists of today. And people's values have been turned around. Social order has been disarranged. The morals have been affected because we have dishonored God in the way that He has presented for you and I to obey. Children are affected. Homes are affected. Marriages are affected when you have a reversal of the roles as far as gender is concerned. I am, if you will, looking at the next verse. Every woman having her head uncovered disgraces her head, disfigures her head. We have dealt with that. Man is in the image of God. I don't have time to deal with the word in the image. But here, as he made, as he made Adam... Adam was made on the form of him who was to come. So the way you see the 16th century artist painting the Christ, you can imagine how Adam, which means man, or ground because he was taken from the ground. How do I know how Adam looked? Because he was made on the form of him who was to come. Was not Jesus the first begotten? Was he not? Though he did not happen, if you will, the, the place of begetting or the place of his birth was not until Bethlehem. But in the mind of God, he was the very first that everything else was going to be staged after. Because of the way that he was to be Coming, man and woman has their own place. Oh my goodness, my goodness. Verse 6, for if the woman be not covered. Verse 6, the word there is a condition of a first class. How strong is it? For if a woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be, this is the condition of the first class. Which means it's very strong, very emphatic. But if it be a shame, everybody say the word shame. Verse 6, but if it be as grown shameful, dishonoring, disfiguring. For a woman to be shorn, the root word is kero, which is to cut. Or suaro, to be shaven. I'm saying it slow. If it is, and this is the condition of a first class written in that syntax, which means, yes, it is a shameful thing for a woman to be with cut hair or shaved head, then what is the remedy? Paul says the remedy is let her be covered. Child, when you break it down word by word, it's not unclear. Young ladies, young men, it's not undiscernible or non-discernible. It is clear what God expects of the man and what God expects of the woman. If we're going to pray and prophesy, here we are trying to put forth a holy thing. Let it not be done in an unholy manner. You don't make it all right. Simply because you have deemed it all right. There's a great deal of time that needs to be spent. On what ramifications we have. And how far you can bring your comments when you're preaching. 
How far, how much liberty do I have in bringing my comments forth? The more I read the Word of God, the more I am giving thanks to God that He just let Rick Trees in. The closer I want to get to what He has said, Rick Trees, this is what my letter says to you. And I've done for you what I've done for you because I love you. And if you will love me, you'll keep. You'll not struggle against it. You'll keep my commandment. Somebody shout hallelujah. Woo! Hallelujah that I can represent him today in the manner that he has commanded me. Thank God that I'm endeavoring to represent and manifest his divine order that Paul said is absolutely necessary. The resolution, the resolve, is if it is in fact a condition of a first class, if it is dishonoring thing, if it is a shameful thing, if it is a dishonoring thing, for a woman to have caro hair that is cut, doesn't matter if it's six inches, six foot, cut. It's one and the same as if it is shaved. And if it is a shame for a woman to have cut or shaved head, the resolve, the way you fix it, he said, let her be covered. I'm telling you, a Sunday school class could understand that kind of verbiage that Paul gave out. Verse 7. Verse 7, for a man indeed ought not to cover his head. Why? Here is the second reason. I'll call it movement. The second movement in chapter 11 concerning the head. For a man indeed ought not. The word is othalo, which is a very binding. Not just you ought not go to town, it's raining today. But Othello is a binding word. For man ought not, if you'll recognize the strength of what he is saying, a man ought not to cover his head. Why? Inasmuch as he is the icon and he is the doxa, he is the image and he is the glory. Woo! We are created in his image. Adam was formed. He was created in the likeness of him who was to come. On the foundation of that, why should we have our head properly presented before God? For two reasons. Because we as man, we are the image icon in Hebrew, it is demut. We are in his image. And when he sees us walking around, when he, Elohim, sees us walking down on this earth, we are intended to be his image. And doxa, which is glory, you cannot sing so well. You cannot have so much charisma and have so much motivational influence and impact that you override whether or not you're bringing glory to God or not. We are in His image. We cannot escape that. You cannot, you cannot divorce yourself from that. You have been created in His image. Everywhere you go, whether or not you're on the platform or whether you're out in the pew 
or whether you're down at the mall, or whether you're out on the lake, or whether you are wherever you are, it is our honor. It is my honor, not just my duty, to bring him my head, my head, the next one in elevation order, to bring God glory. It is my honor and it is my duty to not bring him dishonor. Somebody say, I love you, Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. Because we are in the image of God and we are his, if you will, in his glory of God. But the woman is the glory, the same word, doxa, but the woman is the glory of man because that is next in line of creation. With the woman having the opposite appearance when she stands before God, it brings honor and glory to her head, which is man, which is Christ, which is God. That is the order. Man, above man is Christ, the man Christ Jesus. And then you have the Spirit. And a woman recognizes the beauty of bringing honor to her head. My, my, my. My, my, my. Did the mother of the man that started off this walk of faith, uh, not the mother, but the wife. Did I say mother? I meant wife. Did the wife of the man who started out by faith, did she honor the man or what? For, for those that would like to discuss why she called him Lord, I don't have time for it in the message today, but please write and make a note and make a red mark so that you'll look that up and check that out. Why did she call him Lord? Was there a dispute was there a reason that she gave him the title of Lord? And so it is. Let's continue on. Verse 8. For the man is not, the word preposition is ek. The preposition ek written with the genitive case is out of. And so it is. For the man is not out of the woman. Here he is driving home the order of creation. Woman was not created first. He says it another way here. He says, for the man is not out of the woman, but the woman out of the man. Verse 9, neither was the man created. Dia is the preposition which is because. Far is good, but call... But because is even stronger. Neither was the man created because of the woman. But the woman because of the man. We said it just makes good sense, right? Yes, it does. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for that, for that Holy Ghost science lesson. Historical, archaeological lesson. Thank you. Thank you. We have no qualms with that. I believe that. That's good. That's good. That's good. Now Paul says, let me go on to a third reason. For this cause ought, or fellow, the same binding expression, not we ought to do this because it will be a lot more fun. The word ought is a binding word that is used in this text. For, the, for this cause ought the woman to have exousion. KJV has power on her head. Most of us are familiar with the Greek word dunamis, which is power. That's not the word employed here. The word here is authority, which is power. For this reason, a woman ought to appear correctly before God. Why? 
She ought to have authority on her head. Here is a huge reason that we have not tapped into nor can we exhaust totally because of the angelos, because of the angels. You say, well, I don't know how important that is. Let's look at it just a little bit. That third reason why Paul drives home to the Corinthian church and to all the churches, plural, that a woman is to have uncut hair, her head is to be properly covered, is because of the thing called power, authority on her head because of the angels. What difference does the angels mean? Because the angels were there when woman and man both were created. Don't jump to conclusions. Don't get your exercise right after lunch here. Don't jump to conclusions. Who is the us? Let us make man. Don't jump to conclusions. Angels had no participation in creation. But who is the us? Yes, he was speaking in divine majesty as kingly speech is stating the us. That's true. But you go pick up the Jewish sages and all of them and all is uh, my word, not their word. But you read their belief that they still teach from way back when that the us was the angels that were present and they watched the glory of creation and they pressed the point one verse further for after man had sinned they said and now man has become as us knowing the difference angels did not create there is only one creator he was the father in creation Jesus, who was that creator in flesh, he created all things, and for all things, they, they were created for him and by him. I believe that 100%. But angels were present, and they saw what a man was supposed to look like, and they saw what a woman was supposed to look like, and an angel can be impressed. An angel can be influenced. An angel has no repentance. Why did Paul say, Woman, have your appearance before God in a proper way. Have authority on your head because of the angels. What, what does that mean? God's creation of higher beings. We are created lower than an angel. We have the opportunity to repent when we fall short and we sin. But an angel who falls has no repentance. And an angel is loved by the Creator as well. And he said, you do this because of the angel." They can be influenced. An angel can fall. Did not the dragon in the very last book of the Bible drag one third of the stars? The old Jews taught that God made an angel for every day. I don't know how many days there have been. But if that be the case... And the dragon when he fell, when Lucifer when he fell, Ben Shakar, son of the morning, dragged or, or took with him one third of the stars. That lets me know that there was somewhere in the heavenly realms there was a tra tragedy. There was something that was tragic in the very presence of that omnipresent, all-knowing God, the Spirit. And he said, 
don't, don't show up without the right authority on your head that I placed on you because of the angels. You read Enoch 1, not 2, 3, and 4. It is well known that Enoch 2, 3, and 4 are spurious. Are you pushing for the canonicity of Enoch 1? No, I'm not. I don't have to because you've got two of your New Testament epistle writers that quote from that manuscript. An angel that has fallen cannot repent, though they would request of Enoch himself for a chance of repentance. Go find out the answer to this one. And I'm not a know-it-all. I'm just a student that's trying to discover all the questions. So I'm asking, go find out the answer to this. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. You will find out why, and it is written why. Some obscure places why Enoch was taken because of his faith. Why did God get him off the face of this earth? Don't touch the creation of the angels with your wrong influence. I'm privileged to walk for a few days and worship God. And work as his ambassador here on the earth. Let me not feel that it is an inconvenience. And that I can take it as I wish. I am only here for a little while. To be able to serve. To serve. To serve him. Amen, amen, amen. The image and the reflection of God. The reason of the angels. And then he finally comes down and he says. Skipping down too if you will. For the sake of time. Because verse 11 and 12. Is. Not redundant. But it is just more strength being put into the same. Verbiage. Verse 12. And verse 11. Is not to be passed over. But today, for the sake of time, I am going to verse 13. Judge in yourselves. Is it, the KJV says, calmly. Verse 13, judge in yourself. Prepon. Is it fitting? Is it fitting? After all the things that Paul has just said. Of what to do, what not to do, and the wise to do and not to do. You have the power because the spirit of truth is in you. The Holy Ghost is in you. Tell me, you make a statement about it, he said. Judge within yourself. You've got the spirit of God in you in essence. You tell me, is it fitting? After all I've said, Paul is stating. Is it fitting? That a woman pray unto God uncovered. Karakaluton, uncovered. Verse 14, I'm coming down to a close. Doth not even nature itself teach you nature? Fusis. What is nature? What is nature? What is nature? It is the impression of the creation maker. It is the impression of God's intent. It is the impression of the Almighty God upon His creation. Why does the birds of migratory paths fly south in the winter? Why do they turn around and fly back north in the opposite? Why do the salmon Swim back upstream. Why, why, why does creation do? Doth not nature teach you? Paul is looking at all of the other creation. He is saying here, man and woman has been created. Angels make a difference. Now look at all the rest of the creatures that God has created. And there is order in it. It's not disorder. There is order in all of the creation of God. Look at Fusis, which is nature. 
which is God's imprint upon His creation, doth not nature itself teach you? Teach you what? And here's the strength of it. The million dollar question that you've been wanting to speak out. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have come, long hair, the word just simply is long hair, stop quibbling, stop quibbling over, over length, long hair, doth not nature teach you? If you'll listen up to what God impresses on his creation, You want to know how the Jews looked in 70 A.D., the first century? How did the Jews look? Look on the Arch of Titus. It is the only picture in history of how Jews looked in first century. Look on the Arch of Titus, how they are inscribed and depicted as they are in slavery unto the empire that has taken over them and they are carrying out the articles of their worship. And all of them have short hair. All of the men have short hair. Doth not nature look at all the creatures? Doth not it even teach you that if a man have come, which is long hair, it is, and this time he uses a word stronger than the one that I've been using. This word is atomia, which is shameful. Yes, that's it. But it is an elevated, more intense definition of the word shame. There was a man at a singing convention that sat down on the steps wanting to be comical and said about his singing partner the Bible says it's a shame for you to have long hair oh, it's a shame we don't have enough air conditioning he said in here come on come on don't do that to the word of God the Word of God is not a takeoff script for a comedian. If you're going to try to be funny, do it at the expense of somebody else's writing. Because when you take truth and you try to water it down and you try to lessen it for somebody to throw a laugh at it, my God's not up for laugh. Would you know it today that God will not be mocked? God will not be laughed at. It's not the same thing that the preacher up here is sweating a little bit. And it's a shame in the old Pentecostal gathering that we don't have air conditioning. No, it's not the same thing. If you look at the end of Romans 1, don't turn there, just listen to me. How intense is it? Is it a sin? Or is it not? Come on, let's answer it. Let's stand eye to eye and get nose to nose. And let's square up. You ask me the question, let's answer it. And let's not run around with a real political answer of putting a foot in this thought and putting a foot over here in this thought. The same word in verse 14 that said, if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him. Atemia is the same word that Paul employs at the end of Romans 1 where he is talking about what creation has so twisted themselves into that in the eyes of God it is vile affections. Now you tell me at the end of Romans 1 is that a sin or not? 
Yeah, I'm getting a good I'm 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 getting a good nod from some of you. Come on, come on, come on. Do we believe that it is a matter of salvation? If it's a matter of salvation, then we better pay attention to it. Is it a salvation issue? Honey, when you get to Romans 1 and God says what they're doing is vile and He calls it by the same word in this verse 14. I'm tired of people saying it's not a salvational issue but it makes your relationship better. Please sit down. If that is your rendition of what God has said in so many ways in these 16 verses. Woman that's on the platform with your hair that's shorter than mine with the angels looking on and you're trying to command with the word of God worldwide please sit down. Man that has long hair, come, that is standing trying to manifest a holy God. And you are not in his likeness, as far as what he has asked for a parents. Please sit down. You say some things that I do in being married to my wife, it don't make us married or unmarried, but it makes our relationship better. It ain't the same thing. This ain't the same thing. If he calls it a shame to the level that in Romans 1, as Scripture records that it is vile, And everybody that's under the hearing of my voice today in this building knows that it is a sinful thing that he is describing. Sin separates you from God. Then it is a salvational issue. I love the people who say these words. I love them. But when you use the words that my holiness standards do not make me holy, but they protect my holiness. There is no scripture, sir, that says that. Be ye holy as I am holy. And what God has asked of us, we must do. Everybody say, I love you, Jesus. And so I am through. Thank you for being very patient with me today in a lengthy message tomorrow. I won't use the word promise, but I will come to whatever is closest to the word promise to not do so again tomorrow. But if a woman have long hair, come, it is a glory unto her, for her hair is given to her instead of a covering. Let me answer it in two seconds here. There are some of our brethren who believe that the necessity of a second covering, that you have long hair and you wear a veil over it. No problem. No problem. Wear one veil, wear two veils, wear three veils, wear as many scarves as you want. And I'm not making fun. I'm honoring them because they are precious and they believe that. But this verse says, for her hair is given to her, the Greek word is anti, which is instead of a covering, meaning a veil. For her hair is given to her instead of for a covering. And here the word for covering is truly a proper word for veil. The word here is parabolio, which is truly veil. There are several words for veil, both in the Old Testament, talking about the veil of the temple, and then kaluma, if you will, and there is this parabola. This is one that he is, it's truly veil. For her hair is given to her instead of a veil. I don't make that as a test of fellowship. Do that if you wish. 
but please give me the right to do as Paul said for me to teach as a pastor that it is not necessary for our women to come having to wear a second covering for her hair is given to her instead of a covering. Last verse and I'm out. But if any man, if any man is a Thelonikos, Philo is love. Philonikos, a lover of strife, a lover of debate. If any man is a lover of debate, what if we've got somebody that's got a real happening ministry? And he's got a lot of influence with the young preachers. And he is one of the only ones in a lineup of preachers that can put a crowd on its feet. But when he climbs into the pulpit, he is a strife lover against the ordinances. Paul said that I've tied down, that I don't want to move. Paul had a word for him. But if any man seemed to be a Philonikos, which is a lover of strife. Sorry, we have no such custom. There's no such thing. There's no such thing. Please be seated. Please bring the next man forward. Get the next man up quick. Because we have no such custom. Neither... The churches, plural. So the new theology that is rolling around, and if you listen to anything, listen to this as I'm about to take my Bible and walk to the pew. The new theology, what is proper for your local creation or congregation? The reason you've got this standard over here is because of you've got a certain situation. But it's not the same requirement for this congregation over here. Neither the churches. We are to understand that what God set as divine order is for us today, tomorrow, until the Lord Jesus comes. For the church in B.B. Arkansas, for the church in Baton Rouge, for the church over in Princeton, Virginia, for the church in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Let all the churches acknowledge that we are for the ordinances of God. love you all at the end of this let me say I love you all I love everybody listening out there in radio land and you're looking at one preacher that is so thrilled to just get invited in that I preach it in this way God is there anything else that you want of me I'm not some the way you heard me preach today is pretty emphatic only had, a, only had an hour, a little more than an hour I took to do this. But I'm not some hard-fisted guy that is, that is so caustic in spirit that I can't worship next to you. I want everybody to know I love everybody. And I'm not going to wash out all I just preached about for an hour and 15 minutes. I love everybody. I'm just glad he lets me be here. If you're not doing it right now, then maybe after what you heard today, you'll start doing it. I love you. God loves you. He sent a preacher today to preach to you. But at the same time, God, if there's anything else that you want to tell me to do, if you got any more, I love you enough. Let me do it in the spirit of love that I'm doing it. God, I love you. Thank you for letting me be a part of this. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you enough, Lord, that I'll do anything you ask me to do. My, my, my. I know that I'm on radio land, but I will make one qualifying statement. Don't take this and run what I just said. I can stand by and worship with you.
you just connect that is, is that wherever I stand, I love everybody and I love God. I don't, don't, I, I'm not going to qualify it anymore. Don't take it wrong. Just take it simply as I said and don't be dishonest with it. I'll be glad to stand with your judgment and we'll talk about it before him. But Rick Trace was not supposed to be included. I was not supposed to be included. But while I was yet a sinner, he loved me enough to come down here and do what he did for me. I have no business in the world at all going off and trying to represent him in a disfigured manner. God forgive me if I have ever done that or if I should ever do that. I love you, Jesus. I love your creation. I love your people. One more time, for his sake, would you give him praise?